Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at in the world. Thank you for tuning in with us today. I'm Nicole Sackage, and I'm here with Grant Cameron. And our guest today is Danny Silva. And this is going to be our third installment, third and final installment of a little show we're calling Gossip and Rumors. We're also joined by Grant's assistant, Desta Barnaby. She's in the background running this show for us. So thank you, Desta. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Yeah. Um, I think maybe just to give a quick update to our previous part one and part two, I would like to say that Bob McGuire and Tim McMillan have talked it out. They've shaked hands, <laughs> virtual hands. And they're on the same page now. They're still fine. They're still friends. They still have respect for each other. But the Twitterverse is still going a little crazy with this. So, Danny, you're kind of more into the Twitterverse than we are. And I would just like maybe your opinion to start us off with on what you think about Twitter as a resource in the community and if you think information really gets expressed clearly or if you think it's just maybe a battleground. It's probably all of the above. Um, sometimes it's really helpful, sometimes it's horrible and it's just trolling. You know, we can share information immediately and that's really cool because a lot of generations before us didn't have this advantage of social media or even the computer type stuff. Um, sometimes it's, it's really garbled and you don't know what to expect, but it's also just a tool that we try to use. But uh, um, in a lot of ways, it's uh, made my career, the social media thing. And a lot of us from the newer guys that are dipping into the UFO stuff or the bloggers or whatever you want to call it, social media is how we talk to each other and uh, how we communicate and build our followings and share our blogs and share our information. So um, <clears throat> it's a great tool and it's also super crazy and super horrible when it becomes a battleground, but also I guess it's a way to kind of vet information because everyone's tearing each other apart. And if you post something that's super crazy, there'll probably be a million people talking bad about you and tweeting at you and uh, all kinds of things and you know I want to smack the heck out of some people that are on social media and I can't and uh, that just comes with the territory that you can't uh, meet everybody in person and you can other, other people can say whatever they want and um, it's all kinds of crazy stuff so it is a, it is a battleground too but it's it's great so it's double-edged sword for sure. Mm -hmm. Now I know Twitter kind of limits how much you can say in one tweet do you think maybe that's a factor in, in why um, maybe information isn't expressed as clearly as it could be? Because it's pretty much, you know, shorthand or multiple tweets that have to say something and maybe people don't follow the thread entirely? Maybe a little bit, but it's also, you know, the attention span of everyone is really, really short. Um, I have a really short attention span. That's why a lot of my blogs are pretty short. I try to just kind of like slap people with information and I keep it moving. I'm not trying to be super wordy or anything like that. So it is just the attention span of uh, this generation, I think too. And um, I think less and less people are reading long form articles or books and stuff like that. And we just want it quick. And, uh, but you know, it, I think it does play a factor that it's so short like that, but uh, you can do multiple tweets, like you said, and if people aren't clicking on the multiple tweets, that's their fault. But um you know, and then we see not even just in the UFO community, it's like huge politicians are using it, obviously Trump, but even just other world leaders and it's just a huge platform. So it's kind of a, it's 2020 and this is how it's going. Can, but, uh, Danny, can I ask you about your blog? Can you sort of give your background on, on how you got, because you haven't been around that long. And can you express for me, because I, I sort of pointed out the fact that I noticed you guys were doing some stuff that the older generation was not able to do that you're sort of no the platforms and the how to work the the computer thing can you talk about the platforms that are used by the young people and talk about how you came into it and what your blog is all about i think the platforms that are, that are used are mainly anything we can get our hands on there is the, the main ones you know youtube twitter facebook instagram there's snapchat now there's TikTok, which is really a huge um and just anything that that becomes popular is is a tool to use how I got started was uh, I was just flipping channels on the radio like 20 years ago. Um, and all of a sudden I heard Art Bell's voice and he was talking about UFOs and I was like, what? 
and this was like on an old clock radio or something. And ever since then, I've just been listening to Coast to Coast a lot, listening to Art Bell, George Nori, George Knapp. And um, then uh, I was just a pedestrian, just on the sidelines doing normal things. And then all of a sudden, the A-tip story broke. And there was a lot of us that that New York Times story changed everything for us. We didn't know that um, the government for sure had a program. We thought they did. Everyone thought they did. But then it was right there in black and white, and there was videos attached to it, and there was some guy named Lou Elizondo coming out and talking about it. So that kind of just changed my whole life. I was, uh, I feel like it was like meant to be type stuff, and it just changed everything. And ever since then, I've been totally obsessed, and um, I couldn't get enough of Grant Cameron interviews or anything like that, Grant Cameron stuff, and I couldn't get enough listening to George Knapp and um, listening to all the TTSA guys, and I just wanted all the information. Early on, all it was was social media, Twitter, really, uh, because TTSA was new. And following them, there really wasn't any outlets to do that. So it was a few of us just tweeting. And we were tweeting like a million times a day, trying to find out as much information as possible. It was like the gold rush. And um, all of a sudden, some of my friends wanted to start a blog. And I didn't know anything about blogging. I didn't know anything about writing. I probably still don't. And uh, they um, they started bugging me like every day, like you need to write because we're, we're finding out really cool stuff and we're tweeting about like stories that no one really knows about just from getting on Google and really digging into this stuff. And um, so we started a blog thanks to them and uh, um, that blog kind of dissolved and I started my own and I, I never looked back and um, I've just been super obsessed and people like you Grant and, and other people have been reading it and I'm super honored uh, for that. And um, I've been able to talk some, to some people and make some friends. And I came from a music industry background where you really have to like kill yourself in order to talk to some of these rock stars because they just have so many fans trying to talk to them. So I was able to use that networking ability in the UFO community. And I realized in the UFO community, it's way easier to talk to these high level people than it is to talk to people in the music industry. So I was able to use some of those skills and kind of translated into what I'm doing now. Wonderful. Um, you brought up a tip, and that was kind of bringing me back to I think our part one and part two, where we were bringing up these rumors that people have been whispering about, and, and I'm sure you probably got asked the same way Grant and I did. It's just asked our opinion. You know, what do you think everybody's talking about? What is this big drop that's imminent? And over the last few days, I believe, you know, we did comment that one of these rumors kind of got started by James Fox. He mentioned he had information that was coming out. And he has since um, commented that no, his information and what he was mentioning has nothing to do with these triangle stories that are coming out. And I was wondering maybe if you thought or if you had heard whispers and rumors or gossip that this was maybe another continuation of some information from ATIT, or have you heard anything along those lines? I can just look at what's public um, today, or I think it was maybe yesterday. There's a new um, article with some Elizondo interview uh, excerpts, and you can just see what he said publicly. So I'm just kind of putting two and two together that maybe what he's talking about could be in this drop because Elizondo in the interview is talking about um, finding out in short order, I think he used the term short, in short order, about who ATIP was briefing and some of these senior DOD officials. So it sounds like ATIP was briefing some really important people and maybe the public is gonna find that out. So that could be associated with this drop. The other thing he said uh, in that interview was he said yet, and then he kind of um, emphasized the word yet that maybe some of these other uh, UFO encounters may be coming out, you know, documents about them or who knows what it is. So I'm just going off of public comments. Um, and I thought that was really eye opening that he said that I would love to know uh, who else ATIP was briefing. You know, we heard the story that they were having trouble getting to Mattis, but maybe they were briefing tons and tons of people, um, other other people like that. So just I think there's a lot more of the ATIP story and probably what Elizondo was doing when he was there. You know, it's debated um, highly about the scope of the program. You know, how big was it? Was it small? Was it tiny? 
Um, a lot of people, even with government backgrounds, debate that, and it, it kind of stinks because you know us as like writers or whatever you want to call us, we we don't know which way to go other than I do trust Elizondo and what he says, but um, you know there's other takes to the story. But uh, I think maybe um, what comes out could be um, talking about that according to Elizondo's comments today. So I thought those were pretty eye opening. Wow. Yeah. I'll have to look into those comments. I haven't really got online today at all. We've been busy planning our triangle panel, which is becoming quite explosive now. So that's exciting for us. But um, Grant, did you have a question that you wanted to ask Danny about yeah. TTSA? Yeah. Well, let's, let's take one off of the TTSA. You had a, um, an encounter a week back or whatever on a radio talk show. So get into the whole deal of your opinion on TTSA. You know, that for people that are watching, a lot of people know there's sort of a controversy. Where do you stand on uh, what they've done and um, the sort of the controversy about who they are and what they're doing? I think we have to kind of take what we can get um, in the UFO community. And we can always question things. It's fine. I know a lot of people don't trust uh, you know, to the Stars Academy because they have government backgrounds or they don't trust Elizondo because he have go has a government background. Um, I think it's okay to question things. And, and if you don't want to trust someone, don't trust them. I think we can just look at what they've brought forward alone and um, how valuable it is without trusting anybody. Um, you know, I, I have trust personally, but it doesn't, that doesn't matter. You know, they brought, they brought forward the videos. They changed the world by bringing out the ATIP program. And, um, and they got other people on board. They got, you know, I, I look around um, my circle, my family members, my friends and things like that. And pre 2017, it was really hard to talk to people about this stuff. Now we have Marco Rubio and Mark Warner and other politicians commenting on it um, at heightened levels more so than ever. And now it's like, I can talk to people and I can say, look, there is no debate really that there's UFOs quote unquote flying around um, in the skies, dealing with uh, military, messing with military. And that's almost like, it's, that's like a fact now. It's not debatable. I mean, you can debate who is controlling them, whether it's aliens or Russia or whatever you want to do, that's fine. But now it's like not even debatable that there's UFOs. Um, it's like a proven fact now, basically. Um, and it's just easier to talk to people. And, I, and I've talked to people that used to hate the subject and now they believe it and they're reading my blog and they're reading the New York Times stuff. And a lot of this is um, thanks to the, to the Stars Academy and really thanks to Elizondo and Mellon, um, I think specifically. Those two guys, they're, they've really done a lot on the government side. Plus we have the UAP task force now. And I know there's a lot of questions. Is it gonna be Project Blue Book? Um, we can hold judgment on that, reserve judgment, that's fine. But the thing is there is a task force. It's currently going on and it's not a conspiracy. And that's something we can take to the public. So we're just looking for um, ammo to basically take to the public and get them convinced as activists. So a lot of us, you know, that's our goal is getting the public to believe what we already believe. The goal has never been the UFO community. Um, Elizondo always says that. And I see how it's true because the, the UFO community, we already know what's going on in a lot of ways. And we want normal people, the public to, uh, to believe this stuff so we don't get chastised and that's the way we're going to change the world is getting the public on board. And that's what to the stars has done. Another goal I think that they've had behind the scenes is they didn't want people to get scared. You know, there has always been allegedly this government um, uh, issue that they think the public is going to get scared. And maybe that's not, that's why they're not telling us everything, but uh, you know, that hasn't happened at all. And, and, and in fact, people in a lot of ways, people haven't even cared and they're still watching football and hockey and all this other stuff. And they don't even care about this stuff. So no one's really gotten scared and um, all the goals have been met. And I think it's all culminated with the UAP task force, but we're gonna see how that goes. But just uh, what we could just look at in general is, uh, is great. And that's, that's uh, it's changed everything. So go ahead and don't trust them when they screw up and then you can hold their feet to the fire and they've made some little mistakes. But when they do something really, really horrible, then we can reevaluate it and say, hey, these guys are snakes. But until then, um, they've only done good as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I know a lot of people are upset about the threat angle, and I understand that. But that's more of a kind of a personal thing. And, and maybe, a, you know, they do it from a military aspect. But other than that, I don't see why uh, anyone can really be upset with what they've done so far. You mentioned the Senate. Can you get a little bit into, for people that may not know, what where they're 
because you and I and Nicole and everybody's been talking about this, the rumors of what's happened at the Senate, uh, this report that may be coming out. Can you sort of get into what you know and what you speculate might be happening? Yeah. Um, to the Stars Academy, specifically Elizondo and Mellon, they've set up these briefings, not only them, but the UAPTF guys, which are the old ATIP guys. So it's not just to the Stars Academy, it's these old ATIP guys, you know, Elizondo left, but everyone else that was at ATIP kept going. And now it's evolved into the UAP task force. So they're doing tons of work behind the scenes. They're bringing in people like Fravor, Eric Davis, which we found out about in the New York Times. I mean, this is a huge New York Times article where he's mentioning crash retrievals or whatever he's saying. Um, so they're doing all these briefings. Um, I think even uh, Melinda was talking about some with you guys this week I heard about. But um, mm -hmm. so there's all these briefings occurring. Um, the, you know, politicians and bureaucrats and stuff, they're hearing about it more. Um, Mark Warner, you know, was briefed. You know, Trump said he was briefed. Um, Marco Rubio was briefed and was going on the record about it along with Mark Warner. So all these politicians are getting briefed in these different committees. And um, they're getting the kind of, the, uh, who knows actually what's in the briefing. Maybe they're seeing extended videos. But at the very least, they know that the um, UAP, the UFOs, they're flying around military uh, installations, they're bothering our military, and they're flying around nuclear uh, facilities. So, so this is a huge problem. And just without leaving aliens out of it, that's what they're bringing to the politicians and the bureaucrats and getting them um, on board with this and trying to tell them to, that we need to figure out what's going on at the very least. So now there's the UAP task force. It was kind of always there, but now it's kind of more funded and more um, above ground, I would say, than even the ATIP program was it has more um clout basically you could say and as soon as this bill gets passed there's uh, they're gonna have 180 days to come up with a report a lot of people have questions about the report there will be a classified annex so we don't know everything that's going to be in there but it's just forward movement and it's great forward movement and um the task force is huge and I, I don't know why that's not front page news story on every paper that there's a uap task force currently going on i mean how amazing is this and um but the more uh, you know, civilians, I call them UFO civilians, that we get to Google this kind of thing or just look into it, the more people are going to be impressed and know that it's real. I agree with you there. I want to back up to a comment you made just a few minutes ago. Um, I think you, you mentioned that Elizondo and others in TTSA um, really aren't doing this for the UFO community. They're doing it for the general public. And... I've, this has come up before and people mentioned that they, they believe they're trying to rewrite the, the UFO history and they're trying to forget everything like Roswell, or should I just say, they're trying to rewrite it from the Nimitz videos on. Do you really get that? Um, do you think that's what's going on or do you think this is just the best evidence that's current that the public can really swallow instead of thinking it's just a regurgitation of the last 50 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think that they're trying to do the best they can. Elizondo has commented on Roswell, but mm -hmm. um, we don't know everything he had access to. I would assume he had access to a lot of that old stuff, but we really don't know for sure. Another thing he was mentioning, and um, I've, re I've written about it actually um, a couple months ago, was he was talking about a precursor to ATIP. And it doesn't sound like he's talking about OSAP. He's talking about other programs. We know there's always been programs going on um, in, the, in the United States government. And, um, but we don't know exactly everything that they've been privy to. We don't know everything that's in these uh, briefings that they're doing. So I don't know if they're talking about Roswell or if they're talking about bodies. I would assume not. But, I mean, who really knows? But, um, yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Are they just trying to delete everything out that was that was there? No, I don't think so. But, you know, maybe they just don't want to talk about it. They also have to really hold back, I think, in maybe some of these briefings, and they only can do the best evidence and the stuff that people can sink their teeth into, and they can't get too weird, I, I assume. I'm not really sure. I'd love to sit in on one of these briefings, but, um, <laughs> you know, you even talk, uh, you hear Elizondo talking, uh, you know, publicly, and he's, he, sometimes they try to stay away from this stuff. I get that feeling with Melon sometimes, too. They just want, they want to move this thing forward, and the best way to do it is to not get too spooky, I guess you would say, too early and maybe that's also part of not scaring everyone 
Um, but they just want to bring evidence forward. And you see people complaining all the time. Um, it's funny. It's like, it's always, it's always a double-edged thing. You see people complaining all the time when people say stuff they can't prove. But then Elizondo doesn't talk about stuff he can't prove and he gets flack for it. Yeah. So it's kind of the, it's, it's always the double-edged sword and it's always like naysayers. And, you know, for years and decades and decades, people have been saying government, people come out and tell us what you know. Elizondo does it and then they say, screw you, you're from the government. So I don't, I don't know. They, they, they can't have it both ways every time. And I think we should just be thankful for what we got. Take it with a grain of salt. Don't trust them. That's fine. But look at, look at what they're bringing forward. And, and it's amazing stuff. Um, I've said this to, on your guys' panels a few times. That also, I think there's uh, various goals of UAPTF and, and, not, and they're investigating these things. They're trying to figure them out and get the military basically a better idea of what's going on. I, th I also personally believe that they're more above ground. They're the ones talking to politicians and talking to bureaucrats. So I think also they are kind of trying to get some of these secret access, special access programs, whatever you want to call them. There's lots of different um, acronyms for these programs. They're trying to get them to share their information because it's just, it's illegal, or I don't know if it's illegal. Some people debate if it's illegal. It seems immoral, it seems wrong that mm -hmm. some of these programs aren't sharing. That's another thing that um, Elizondo brought up today in the interview, although he said he couldn't find any evidence of other programs. I personally believe they're there. I mean, I, I, a lot of people seem to believe they're there. And um, we need to get these programs to be sharing stuff, and especially in the hands of UAPTF. Let's say that the task force knows of another program. I, I, I can't prove that they do. Let's say they do, let's, just for argument's sake, they know of another program. Just because you know of another program doesn't mean you can go take anything from that program and show it to politicians and bureaucrats. So I think that's the goal is that they want to get some of this information from these other programs and be able to share it with Marco Rubio and Mark Warner and really convince some of these people. And who knows about the Biden Harris administration, what's going to go forward. I think that's really exciting too. Anytime there's change, Republican or Democrat, uh, you know, we can have hope that something big might happen. So, you know, I think they want to share it with these people and, there's, it's like, it really doesn't seem like a lot of these politicians and bureaucrats, whether they legally have access to this stuff, it, regardless, it seems like they don't. Um, they're not getting that. Even if they deserve it and they legally should have it, it seems like they're not getting it. The, the briefings that they're supposed to be getting from these real secret programs. So I think that's part of this whole um, thing too with the task force. I think ATIP probably um, ran into a lot of those problems also. So I think that's a big goal of the task force and a, I think it's a big goal of what we're seeing going on today. And it's maybe even a re part of the reason that Elizondo left. Um, you know, he was frustrated and, and uh, it just seems like everything he's done has worked. And I'm sure, you know, everybody that um, was in ATIP, they're still doing really, really, really amazing things with the task force and all this stuff. So it's going on from a lot of different angles and a lot of people are working on this stuff and we're just not hearing about it. Right. Now with um, Rubio and Warner's inquest coming up and the information that they're gathering there is talk that um they think they the they think they will get a lot of information from various groups like the fbi and other government entities to come together but the general outcry is that whatever we the public get is going to be so sanitized and still kept under lock and key um, are you along those lines of thinking, or do you think we're going to get some actual hard information or, yeah, what do you think? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, I would think that why would they put it in there if we're not going to get anything, but I'm just kind of waiting to see. And I think it's almost equally important. Um, you know, I want the public to have everything and I want to see it for myself, but it's also very important for some of these politicians that are getting the funding and getting that um, the stuff to see this, these things too. So I can see both sides of it. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. We may end up getting burned, but I know that there's a lot of good people in the task force and um, they were in ATIP and there's other people doing things. So I, at the same time, I think I have faith in them that maybe something great will come of it, but I don't know, it may be extremely sanitized. Maybe what we get, it'll be sanitized and it'll still be really cool. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that they're not just gonna dump everything on the public right away and that's why they put that that classified annex wording in there. But I'm kind of just having to wait to see. And this is all positive movement. So I'm just happy that it's happening regardless. But um, we're gonna have to wait and see. And maybe, you know, nothing will happen. Maybe something horrible will happen and there isn't even this report and nothing, ha and nothing comes of it. But um, 
we can at least, you know, be happy that there's a task force going on. It's like, imagine if ATIP when it was going on was announced. That was always kind of my dream because I felt like when the New York Times story came out, um, it was m being misreported that ATIP had already ended in 2012. We knew it was still going on because of Elizondo's words. But I was always thinking, what if the public knew there was a current um, program going on? What would that do for like this promotion of the subject? And it's happened now and it hasn't been promoted as much as I would like at all. I would really like, you know, someone from the task force to come out like a face and to have like a public, um, like a public speaker or, or, or a press officer or something. That would be really, really cool. And I think that would be great. So like for a Heineck equivalent? Because Blue Book was public. And so, I mean, yeah. Dr. Heineck was kind of like the public spokesperson for Blue Book for a long time. So you think we maybe need some transparency like that? I would love it. I mean, I yeah. don't know that it's going to happen. It may take five or 10 years or it may never happen. But I would love it. I'm just thinking from a promo aspect of getting the public mm -hmm. on board and more interested. I think it would be great if we had some kind of a Fox Mulder guy up at the podium answering questions for the press. That would be so cool. That's probably a pipe dream, but I don't, it probably isn't going to happen. But it would be really cool. Who would you want that to be? First person that pops in your head. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe Mellon or Elizondo could, you know, I wrote a blog um, a while back too about maybe they're going to go back to government. Maybe they'll run for Senate or something like that. Maybe they'll take bureaucratic positions. So it would be cool if they just like went back to government, got hired back, and then they were the spokespeople because they're already – you know, so well spoken when they talk. Like, I mean, hearing Mellon and uh, Elizondo speak, it was like amazing. It's like hearing like some classic president talking, but he's talking about UFO stuff. It's great. I would love to see one of them or even someone we've never heard of, you know, just answering questions for the public. What if it wasn't Susan Go or Goff or however you pronounce her name, you know, the, the villain of the UFO community in many ways. What if it was someone and they're not only doing press releases written, but they're actually doing speaking engagements and things like that. I'm just dreaming here. But uh, it would definitely be really cool. And um, I think it would go a long way as far as just, you know, they could use all these clips on ancient aliens and the news and everything else. They could have some person they could focus on other than Elizondo or whoever that's actually speaking for the government. Every time Lou has spoken, he's speaking as a previous employee and he's not speaking as a current employee. So mm -hmm. it would just be really cool to happen. But again, I mean, it probably won't, but it, I'd love it. I agree. Great. Let me ask a question. Let me ask a question. You mentioned the, the new the administration, and we really probably are not going to know for a while what they're going to do. But let's go back to the old administration. Um, there's an article that just came out where uh, we already knew that Trump had fired the Secretary of Defense, and then he fired a bunch of people on the Defense Science Board, Kissinger, a bunch of high level people, and seems to be just canning everybody. So, my question to you and when Trump came in, everybody figured this is this crazy guy. He doesn't, he's not scared of anybody. Uh, why did he not drop, in your opinion, the UFO secret if he had, or did he not have it? I have no idea. I listen to you about a lot of this stuff, Grant. I've been listening to you for so many years about it. I feel it's weird that you're even asking me. I should be asking you this, but um, I'm not sure, man. I, I don't know. I, I, I go back and forth on what the presidents know. I mean, just looking at ATIP, I mean, Obama was there for it. We could even go before that and maybe Bush Jr. and all this kind of stuff. And um, you know, what did Obama know? Like, did Obama, because the ATIP story broke right after Trump was elected, right? So, I mean, what did, did Obama put that in motion and then it happened? Or was it because of Trump? Or did it have nothing to do with the presidents? I'm just speculating my, you know, my butt off over here. I, I have no idea, basically. And um, I don't know what they know. I think it's really cool that Trump said he was briefed um, on some of the stuff. He said he didn't necessarily believe it, but uh, he believes the pilots, whatever that means. But uh, so I thought that was really cool. But I, I don't know what they know. And um, I really stopped short of even trying to understand it because I don't know. But uh, I'm, I wonder about that, you know, greatly. And um, I would love it. But I, I, I just, I'm hopeful about the new, the new um, Biden-Harris administration. Um, maybe the nothing will change. That, but we had some great developments under Trump. I mean, I don't know if it was because of him, but it's been a great <laughs> four years under him as far as UFO news. It's been like the biggest four years ever. So did it have anything to do with him? I don't know. It mostly had to do with ATIP and Elizondo and these guys, but we've had great forward movement and I just don't want it to stop. But I don't think it's going to. I don't think they would have released the um, and confirmed the UAP task force, you know, if they were trying to cover this up as much. And Grant, I always go back to a lot of the great things that you've said over the years. They always stick in my head. And you always say, why would they even talk about it if they want to cover it up? They just wouldn't say anything at all. 
And I, I, that, I always think about that. I agree with you. Now, I talk to other reporters, and they're saying, well, they're dropping UFOs up because they're covering up United States technology, and they want us to think it's UFOs. I doubt it. Maybe in some cases, but I doubt it. Why would We're investigating our own uh, nuclear plants and nuclear facilities, and we're scaring the heck out of everyone. It just doesn't make any sense. But So I go back to your, uh, your quote a lot, Grant, and why are they even talking about this when Canada isn't saying anything and no one's talking about it? So that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, going to your your statement about what was Obama, though, just for the record, um, I've been pushing on the call. She's in Illinois, and Obama's files are about to be released, and I've sort of uh, trained Nicole what we're going to do, and we're going to go after the files of, of all these uh, people in the former administration. And for the record, um, uh, Obama did make one statement about when he had the speech at Roswell where he said, we'll keep our secrets here. When, he's, when he, he made the speech where he didn't have to say that. He, he came out and he, he talked about it. And so you, you have that. And the other thing is with the new administration, um, I know that in 2007, there was a, um, a Democratic um, debate in Philadelphia. And Biden was actually asked after the interview by MSNBC. And he just said, oh, come on, uh, come on. Get, get, are you serious? Like you're asking me about UFOs. Mm -hmm. He seemed pretty skeptical, but... Can you talk a little bit about Harris being on the on the committee that was briefed? Yeah, supposedly she was. I guess I know I'm just listening to you guys. I'm listening to Melinda and everyone else. And Melinda said she was able to confirm it, but then uh, didn't she say that like some event couldn't confirm it for her or something like that? So that's really all I know, and we can just kind of speculate. She was on some of these committees. I don't know. I'm not an expert on a lot of this um, political stuff. Dean Johnson is really following it well on uh, social media, but um. I don't know if the whole committee has to be there if they're necessarily uh, when they're briefed or if just some members. I don't, I'm not sure how it works. I have a lot of questions. I mean, we're, I'm kind of hopeful that um, Harris was there for a lot of this stuff. Biden was, you know, the vice president for a long time. So it isn't like yeah. they were just civilians coming in like Trump was. They have this ingrained history um, in government. So you would think they've been hearing about a lot of this stuff. I mean, the other question is, <clears throat> how much do these government officials even care about the UAP subject? They have so much on their plate and so much to deal with. So I, I don't know, but um, I'm hopeful that Harris was there and that she knows some things and, and uh, that they focus uh, more on this. I hope we have a lot more political stories to go into. And if Elizondo's right, where he's talking about, you find out um, more people that ATIP briefed, more senior DOD officials, I think that'll be really cool. And that'll be a lot of uh, hints on where to go and where to look. Um, and, as, and just understanding exactly more of what was going on with ATIP. And we only can imagine who UAPTF has briefed. Mm -hmm. Well, if we believe uh, former Senator Harry Reid and what was released with the Nimitz, he said that was only the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, it was minute compared to the rest of the information that they did have or have collected. So I'm very hopeful that more of that will come out in the future. And I've seen the pictures that Grant has posted in several interviews where it's the pictures of the disks. And I mean, I know how much information can be stored on one writable disk. So when you have a book full of multiple disks, to me, that says there's hundreds of hours of footage, at least. So I'm very hopeful for more to come out. Um, Grant, did you have any more follow-up questions I, that you wanted to I, ask? I got, I got a couple of small questions. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned music. You were in the music industry. And as you know, I wrote a book on music and uh, aliens and all that kind of stuff. Did you ever run up against uh, musicians who had an interest in the UFO phenomena in your music career? Um. I've heard of a lot of people. There's a huge rapper right now named Kendrick Lamar, and he talks about uh, seeing a UFO. Um, I think uh, he's going to get into it more. So it's always cool when we get these big um, public uh, celebrities talking about it. It's really cool. And I, it is interesting where I know you've talked about a little bit of just like, where do we, where do these ideas come from? Where does creativity come from? It's really interesting. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get music ideas and is it coming from God or where is it coming from? You don't know. And just any of these creative ideas and anything. So that's always interesting to me. But yeah, there's a lot of, you know, music is really open to it. And part of my goal was, um, I haven't really succeeded in any way is to, because I was coming from hip hop music. I wanted more of uh, the hip hop community to, uh, to be activated in, in, in the UFO subject. And a lot of people were really interested in conspiracies. And I feel like they, 
get interested in really these stupid corny ones that they're getting like this horrible information from YouTube. And if we could just get some of the solid stuff into their hands, it could really affect change. Um, like even just the Nimitz stuff or any of the solid UFO information rather than they're talking about the New World Order and all this other crazy stuff. And not saying there's nothing to it, but they just get really, really weird. And um, I would just love for them to get more solid stuff and really be activists. And that would be really cool if we could get the younger generations on. And um, everyone wants this information out. It's like the younger you are, the uh, the more open you are to this stuff. And um, I think we're chipping away at that. And But I would love that for that to happen. And I'm, I'm hopeful a few people are making documentaries now, and I think it's going to include um, some big musicians and things like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to change things. Great. My, my, maybe. I was going to oh, say, sorry. maybe we'll have to collaborate with you, Danny, and use some of your resources. Cause I know you just mentioned Kendrick Lamar. I've been talking about Post Malone who kind of came out on the Joe Rogan mm. experience. That's and, right. Yeah. I know Britney Spears has been in the headlines lately, along with um, Demi Lovato, and it just seems mm -hmm. like it's a pop star kind of thing right now, or, a, a, you know, like you mentioned, hip-hop background as well, and these stories would be interesting to track down because they are influencers, so it would be nice mm -hmm. to see, you know, where their thoughts truly lie, or if it's inspirational in any sort of way, so go it's ahead. It's crazy. I'm, I'm always... Uh... I'm always thinking about what would happen if like James Mattis came out and talked about it because he was so famous. But honestly, he isn't as famous as like any of these pop stars in the mm -hmm. world. And like they're actually more important than any of these politicians would be in a lot of ways other than maybe like the president and stuff like that. So they have clout. They have tons and tons of people listening to them. And uh, so anytime they talk, it's a big thing. And, and they influence the young people, which I think uh, is important that... Um that the young people are the ones who still have open minds as to uh, changing ideas about what UFOs might be and if they get involved. And that was one of the things and that's sort of my last question. Um, I, I sort of uh, got taken with you guys, a bunch of what I call the young gun guys that had come in and we always just have a joke in the UFO community. I remember one guy was running a conference and one woman came up and said, is there a senior, is there a senior discount for admission? He said, if there was a senior discount, everybody get a discount. No, there isn't. And, and so I was very happy to see you guys. Can you talk a little bit about some of the guys you're working with and talk a little bit more about your blog, what it's called? And um, the, one I, the one young gun I'd like to talk about, maybe he's not a young gun, but uh, I call him UFO Google, who you work with a lot. And I, the, the final episode or the final part of that question is, what do you think the chances of Nicole getting an interview with UFO Google? We're trying to push for him to come public here and uh, talk about what he knows, because this guy, is one of the most impressive guys I've ever run across in decades. Yeah. Juliano Marinkovich, he's the man. He's a great friend of mine. He is the greatest, like, you know, just researcher behind the scenes. He helps everyone out. He's totally selfless. He's a shy guy. He doesn't like to do a lot of interviews. He's always kicking me his interviews. People ask him to do interviews, and he's like, no, I'll just have Danny do it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I don't know, he's, he's like so helpful. And I know he's helping like all the legends behind the scenes. I know you talked to him, Grant. And um, he's just the best. Like anytime you need anything, he's like an archivist. He's got it. I don't know how he finds time to do all this stuff and record anything. Anytime I need anything, I'm just hitting him up. And uh, I, he needs to do some more interviews. We get to get him out of his shell a little bit because he's so, uh, he's so influential behind the scenes. He's just so amazing. I know he has been on Coast to Coast with George Knapp. And um but he's like, he doesn't get enough credit. He's the man. Um, his, his Twitter is uh, at Omni Talk Radio, Juliano Mringovich. Mm -hmm. He's interviewed Lou Elizondo. He was like one of the first people to interview Elizondo when it was really hard to get to Lou. Now it's pretty easy and Lou will talk to a lot of people, but back then it was a lot harder. Um, Juliano's just the greatest and he's, he, I've never seen him argue with anyone. He's just a gentleman and I can't say enough good things about him. He's the man. And uh yeah, he needs he needs to get more credit, but it's like by choice. He's just in the behind the scenes and just working quietly, and he doesn't want to be in the spotlight. It's just how he how he likes it. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think I tried to interview him once two years ago, and he like didn't even want to do an interview with me. And I'm like, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. There's a lot of other young guns um doing things. There's a lot of great people, and I think a lot of this generally is because of the A tip story. I hate to say it, but a lot of us um are really interested in it, and I think even now. A lot of the uh, mainstream reporters um, that are covering the UFO subject is because of all this and because of this movement. Um, 
but yeah, Giuliano was great. And uh, there's a lot of people doing things. James Landoli is a good friend of mine. There's just a lot of other people that are doing things behind the scenes. You know, everyone has our lives. None of us get paid for this really. And um, so it's always like a struggle to just live our lives, work our regular jobs and then still do this. Um, there is a few people that are able to be like uh, full-time journalists just covering this and my hat's off to them. It must be amazing to do it, but the rest of us have to kind of juggle our lives and everything else. But um, it's just a really great thing. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm glad that there is a lot of more people and I'm getting challenged every day. I feel like I'm surrounded by geniuses. I feel really stupid when I talk to some of my friends and, um, and some of these other people, they're like really great writers. They're really great researchers. And I'm just uh, some guy writing blogs, but um, you know, they say if you surround yourself with really smart people then it kind of elevates you. So that's just how I feel what I'm doing. And uh, it's just great. And um, I, I'm, even uh, people that are just influencers, like, you know, UFO Jesus, Ryan, he does a great job and he has a huge fan base and he uses humor and um, a lot of people knock him for it, but uh, you know, it works great. And, um, and he has a lot of people that follow him on YouTube and he does a really great job getting information out. Uh, talk a little bit, again, a little <laughs> bit about your blog and uh, cause your blog sort of took off. You just started a couple of years ago and you got a lot of attention. You got a lot of people reading your blog. You, I think you've actually got some, some higher level people that are sort of, sort of interacting with you and stuff like that. So talk, give, give people where you can read your stuff and, and the kind of stuff you've done. It's silverrecord.com, S-I-L-V-A-R-E-C-O-R-D.com. Um, and I'm just a normal person in a lot of ways. I don't, I have some opinions, but a lot of times I'm listening to people smarter than me. I was, I don't have a government background, you know, I'm listening to Elizondo and, and um, I'm listening to Mel and I'm listening to you, Grant, and everyone else. And um, I'm just trying to report on it. I boil it down. That's my thing is I boil it down into kind of easier pieces. And, and even um, some UFO civilians, they read my stuff and they don't know what's going on. So I only can imagine, and you know, it's harder for them to follow. So I only can imagine when they're reading these really long, intricate articles, they're, they're probably tuning out. I mean, there's, there's a huge learning curve. George Knapp always talks about it with the UFO subject. So I try to boil my stuff down and even how it is now, it's still not boiled down enough for regular civilians. It is for the UFO community, but that's kind of where I come from. And I just try to break stories quickly and give people the information and kind of move on. And I'm not trying to use poetic language or anything and make it sound real crazy. And a lot of times I'm writing these blogs as like breaking stories. I'll be up you know, to like three in the morning working on it and just one day and I'm done. You know, I'm not working on it for a year. Um, that's, and other people do that and they have really great, huge stories and I'm kind of coming at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. But uh, th they can always uh, listen to me and they can DM me and I'm always looking for stories and I'm able to answer questions. And uh, that's basically it, silverrecord.com. And um, I was able to get, uh, just from continuously writing blogs, I was able to get some people to listen to me. And I mean, I was really blessed and honored when you were uh, shouting me out, Grant, early on. And I was just some jerk and you were talking about my blogs and really helped my <laughs> career and I got people to uh, take me seriously. So I'm always thankful for that, man. Just, just uh, my, my last question and then I'll leave it to uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole's little segment here is called The Rumors and Gossip. And you don't have to tell us what you're doing, but do you have any big stories you're about to break? Um, you know, I'm on my toes these days. There's a lot of other people doing really, really great work and it's really intimidating. And the, uh, it, it wasn't like even just a couple years ago when the A-tip story broke and there was only a handful of us. Now there's a lot of people doing things and there's a lot of great stories and it's, and it's great movement. So, um, let's see, what am I working on? I'm trying to, I, I told it, um, I mentioned it on, uh, your panel, I think I'm trying to, I'm going to do a blog on Gary Nolan and just kind of some basic tactics he's using and all of science uses to um to get uh information out so i'm going to do that blog and then explain i explain who he is explain who gary nolan is sir dr gary nolan he's a you know world-renowned um scientist he works on cancer now he's doing covid stuff but he's also you know has talked about uh, some of his experiences and he works with jacques Vallée. they're studying materials um they also um, did work that was published on my blog, written by Twitter user Jay about the Kade Putamen, along with Kit Green. So he's doing all this kind of, um, I don't want to say paranormal, but it will be in that area where he's doing UFO stuff. And the fact that he's such a huge scientist, an important guy, and he's also doing this lends credibility to it. And, and let's be honest, that's what brings the most credibility to this stuff. That's why guys like Chris Mellon and um, Steve Justice 
and these other guys, when they're talking about UFOs, a lot of us really listen. They're not just in the UFO community. They're really, really successful people. So that's always good. Um, and uh, Gary Nolan has kind of hinted about what they're doing. He's talked about it on Twitter and other places. And I always go back to his strategy on how they do this. And basically they, um, they release little things, little, little facts. And this is how, apparently, this is just how a lot of scientists do it anyways. So they, they release little facts here and there. They get them to publish in like maybe smaller journals. They build their case. And then eventually they're able to take all these pieces that have already been kind of proven and make the larger argument about what's going on. And I think that's what they're going to kind of try to do with some of these ultra materials, meta materials, or whatever you want to call it. Because let's be honest, if they just put it out, no one's going to believe them. They're going to get flack. But if it's kind of proven in these scientific journals, it'll be harder for people to uh, kind of diss. So yes. I think that's what they're trying to do. And, and so it takes, it's a longer process. And um, I know that there's a lot of debate behind it publicly and behind the scenes of how to go about this. Um, or is it even provable at all? You know, is it provable to, to, to say that humans didn't build some of these materials or, or will they never be able to prove it? So we're, it's kind of remains to be seen. But um, that's what they're working on. And I'm going to just try to highlight maybe some of their tactics in a short blog. Um, and I was inspired to do that while I was on the panel a couple of weeks ago. So I'm working on that one next. That's great. And just uh, a quick reference. He, he was featured in James Fox's film, The Phenomenon. And he is uh, the scientist who took Jacques Vallée's metamaterials and had them tested. So everybody can look that up. It's great part of the movie. Um, Grant, was there anything you wanted to nope. add? Nope. Um, well, I think we're about to wrap it up here. And Danny, I just wanted to say our friend Peter Robbins pointed out to me a few years ago when I talked to him about being more public um, with my own personal experiences and just how I could do good in the community. And he pointed out to me that the best of us not only do very good research, but we also become educators along the way. And that is how I feel about you, Danny. I think you are an educator amongst us in this field. So I just wanted to say thank you for your work and keep it up. And I follow you just like you follow Grant. So <laughs> it's good uh, to have this much. work where we can all yeah. bounce ideas off each other and support each other as well. So yeah, thanks. thank you, you very much for your time. And, uh, thanks so much. Your panels are awesome. And that's what, is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, even if I'm breaking stories or if I'm not, I'm trying to just take what's going on and putting it through my mind and, and then giving it out to my audience or whoever. And I think that's just what we have to do moving forward is to get people uh, on board and get the public on board. So thanks guys. And thank you Grant for everything you've done. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Desta. She's here today too, recording it all for us. Thank you, Desta. And thank you everybody for tuning in to our third and final installment of Gossip and Rumors. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, thank you.